Okay, so I would like to talk about getting data out of taxonomic publications. All our publications, our scholarly knowledge is in, in taxonomic publications. According to Biodiversity Heritage Library, this includes something like 500 million pages. This is the result of taxonomists and biodiversity scientists who want to communicate their findings about taxa. This is done in sections of text, like the way Linnaeus started to do. In 1758, Linnaeus created the first book, which included all the known species at that time. Already at that time, he had a very structured way to communicate his, his uh, findings. So he had a nomenclature element where he introduced the name. He had something like treatment citations where he referred earlier work. We, we are uh, not uh, used anymore. Then he had a description and he have, had a biology and ecology section, which refer to, in this case, the pollinators, the, poly the pollinated plants. So that means each species has at least one taxonomic treatment, many have many more, and each of the subsequent treatments, they augment ex pre previous ones or, or uh, synonymize them. There are tens of millions of them exist, and each includes a placer of, of uh, facts. When you look at this from a bit a distant way, you could say a, a PDF, which is the most uh, commonly used uh, means to uh, publish today, early has been books and journals. It has, it is like a scientific, uh, scientific article. So it has metadata, it has images, tables, references, but it has these taxonomic treatments. When you look at an article from a knowledge graph point of view, it is a very rich ecosystem that has a huge number of links internal. All these links are implicit, so you read them as an author, you can immediately understand. But if you actually think about this, this is a really interesting place to extract this data and build a knowledge graph. And they're not only citations within an article, but they're also citations to external, like physical specimens. And of course, this means we could use this data easily for other purposes. So when we talk about publication and making a publication accessible, it's not about just liberating, pirating a, a PDF. It's essentially about annotating a, a, an article with a lot of metadata. So we want to know what's inside, like it has these treatments inside, it has figures inside, and we want to make it accessible so machines can read that and add it to a rapidly growing knowledge graph. But it's not just the PDF or the article we are interested in. We are actually interested in, in, in data elements inside. So we're interested in treatments. So we want to make them fi findable, accessible. We, and we are interested in, in the figures in this publication. So you also want to make them findable and accessible. And we, at the end, we're also interested in, in the very fine data in these publications. So once we have these publications, we can do something really wonderful. We can take these converted articles and make them widely accessible. So in our case, we get PDFs, we convert them, and we make them accessible in various formats. We disseminate them to our colleagues in, in the green world, the biodiversity world, like to do GBIF, where we disseminate images, treatments, and material citations. We have other tools like Open Biodiff, we'll hear later, or Sooner Species uh, System on Names, or on global biotic interactions. But it also allows us to, to share data now with other communities, like the genomics community, by giving them all the treatments so they can use it for their own tax and data mining. We can go and collaborate with Wikidata. So essentially, that allows us to break down the barrier between science and the, the citizen sciences and the, and, and the great public. And not least because all the data is open, accessible. We now can use Google to look into our content. Like here, a couple of use cases. Like GBIF takes our data using a Darwin Core archive to, to import data from us. It displays it differently. So they're only interested in occurrences and, and uh, taxonomic treatments. Then they 
added to their catalogs. They also display each material citations individually. And the cool thing about this is that you come from one point on the map, we can go to the treatment back, and from treatment, you can go to the article. So you have a link back. Or one of the really fascinating things is the forgotten images and, and in our publications. So suddenly, we can actually do things about these uh, the figures in publications. We can build applications, use them, sort them, compare them, make use of artificial intelligence to identify them. Or we can act you know, start using treatment and treatment citations to build by machine the catalog of life. So how do we do that? In, essentially, it's a linear process. We get publications, we import them, which is an, an, uh, an important step because most of these PDF prisons are really difficult to break because the way PDFs are constructed. But once we have text liberated and, and we can start to enhance it, we can create links, we can do semantics to it. We can create open fair data. So we make deposits in order and get uh, the, the the ID is back. We can do data quality control. We can provide access and metrics about this data so we know who, who published what. And we disseminate this data. For that, we have two major uh, tools like this Golden Gate, there's the, the processing, and we have Treatment Bank, which is essentially storage and, and distribution area. For any of these questions, more technical questions, you can talk to Guido Sartre is in the here. But one thing is we are interested in too is that we want to learn about who's what is who is using our data and what are errors in our data because only knowing errors helps us to to improve. So we talked about we have an internal quality control, but if also feedback feedback mechanisms. So when GBIF says, "Oh, there is a problem in this data set," we get a feedback. We we register it. We use that. Same is for the name system. Or in this case, with the, the, the Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics library system, they take all our treatments and analyze them and send a feedback, which we can use for, for control, for analysis. So the internal workflow quality control tool essentially is implemented after pro processing of, the, day of the, the articles. It's based on a set of criteria that can be controlled algorithmically. The error report reports categorized errors. So they are from severe to not so severe errors. The QC tool is linked to an editing tool, which allows you directly to fix the errors. And it creates a statistics, which allows us to further analyze errors and find out what is the probable source of it. Furthermore, in order to be closer to fit for use, we install the gatekeeper, which essentially takes the, the quality control report and looks at, does this article define to be released or not? If not, then we'll have to go back and fix it. But if it's released, we're pretty sure the data is in a way we want to have it. So the, uh, schematically, that means we get errors, messages, individual error messages or, or whole entire lists. We collect them. Of course, we fix errors as quickly as we can because that's our way we operate. We analyze them. We have find out sources of errors. So some of the errors, we, we cannot do anything about that. If a geo coordinate is wrong in, in the, the document, we cannot change. But there are also things we did never consider. So if something like that happens, we, we write a feature request and think of whether we should make it implement this. But we can also talk to our publishers and say, hey, look, there is a problem about your layout. Maybe if you change your layout, then we could much easier extract your, your data. For example, this has been done together with EJT and, and uh, Painsoft, where we wrote a, a guideline how to publish uh, material citations. So roughly, we, that's our processing last year. We, we, we processed 100, 180 different articles and books. In total, we now process 700, which means we can more or less open any, any uh, kind of articles. We process in total 35,000 articles. We have 350,000 treatments. 
we have 72,500 new species, which includes also uh, 45,000 treatments, which on new species, which are only on, uh, on, on GBIF because of our rapid turnover. And we have about 20, uh, 31,000 uh, data sets on GBIF, which is more than half of all the, uh, the, the data sets in GBIF. We hope by 2021, we can liberate in total 750,000 taxonomic treatments, 450,000 figures, and, 50, and it should be about 50% of all the, the annually new described species. We hope by that, that we convince you that it, that's really the way forward, the way we uh, make data and we publish our taxonomic works. Last but not least, I would thank Arcadia for the very generous support for, for this work. It's not just work for us, but I consider that a really big contribution towards the biodiversity community and to essentially change the way we operate and we make our data to a very wide world accessible. Thank you. So, Donna, do you have a few questions? And they're at the bottom of your document. So, there's a question whether type specimen record from plots and the museum institution provide a cheap with double entry. Yes, this is going to happen. And also in a deliberate way because the museum entry is about the specimen and the, the, the plot C or the treatment entry is about data about the specimen. So there are two different things. And just today, GBIF had a global board meeting and they announced that they made big strides ahead on, on deduplication and essentially finding out which are those uh, occurrences which actually belong together. And so clustering them. And that's essentially, if you follow the discussion here in TEDWIG, is essentially the essence of the, text, uh, the, uh, the digital specimen. So the digital specimen is an umbrella, which is all different aspects of a, a specimen. There's another question, how is the data accessible? The data is accessible through Plotsy, it's accessible through Synodo, it's accessible through uh, GBIF. You can look at the public, the, my presentation, which is online, and have some insights, or go to Plotsy website. There's another question, is how is it related to Zoobank and Zoological Record? So there are two different things. We collaborate with Zoobank, so with the intent that we share our position identifier, because again, Zoobank is about names, and we are about data about names. So if you go to us with the same UID, you get data about a name. If you go to Zoobank, then you, you get the taxonomic, the, the nomenclatural side. Zoo Record, it's a private enterprise to a commercial enterprise to the index all, and we talk to each other, but we don't collaborate. And I think our strategy is we have to have all our data accessible, so we cannot have these very basic catalogs of lives behind paywalls. How do you handle synonyms and or related species? So we handle synonyms because we, in these taxonomic treatments, Marcus will show later, there are taxonomic treatment citations. So similar to a bibliographic citations, also uh, cite earlier treatments by taxonomic treatment citations. And then if you make a synonym, you actually type this relationship. So you add like soon off. So you know this in this publication, it is a this is a synonym and that therefore this name is now mute. And we can model that. And if you go to Suno species, you can look at that how we do it using RDF in this case. I think that's all the questions. 
there's a few more in the document, but you're almost out of time. But um, there was a couple of questions that came through early on about um, your ability to mine documents in BHL. Yes, we, we look into this as a next step to, to collaborate with BHL. So that's not, not excluded. And we, it's just a question of priority because we focus mainly on, on ongoing work. But now that we want to go drill back into the using treatment citations, then we, we will go back and, and use uh, BHL material and collaborate on that side. But yes, we're interested in this. So there's a technical question, no spring, no hibernate, but let's, you have to query this with Guido. So you can, in the, in the, in the chat, you can uh, talk about this with Guido Salto. Um, what is the decision-making process for handling disputed species? We, we only handle with, we, we, we are not solving conflicts. We only model publications. Anything which is published, we, it's what we deal with. So essentially, that's part of the catalog of life and the new, the new version of catalog of life plus, which will have a way to deal with disputes. Yes, in the, there is a link to, to data standards, and that's exactly a talk Marcus will present later on. Who is, a, who is responsible for delivering PDFs? Ideally, we get them all. That makes life easier. Or else we have contracts with publishers. They, they, they want to work with us and want to use this dissemination. Or we have Arcadia who thinks it's important that we liberate data and we do it using like our legal channels like access to, to libraries. But we hope essentially that we can convince the entire community to use either publish semantically or come to us or other, other institutions to convert data and make them really accessible. If you're concerned about biodiversity and this biodiversity crisis, we are free to assure that whenever we publish something, this data is immediately accessible in a format that it can be really reused. Before we move on, we want to keep on time. So the next speaker is Maria Dimitrova from Pensoft. She will talk about semantic publishing enables text mining of biotic interactions. Hello, everyone. Um, I'll start sharing my screen and okay so yes I'll be talking about extracting interactions from literature and these are my co-authors Yuri Polin from Globi, uh, Georgi Relezov and Theodor Georgiev from Pensoft, Donat from Platzi and uh, my PI Professor Lubomir Penev. So um, species interaction data are important now more than ever. And uh, where they usually found is in data sets inside uh, spreadsheets or tables, but sometimes they're also found in literature where they can also be found in uh, tables or in free text. And since now it's really important to have this data findable, accessible, reusable and interoperable, um, since a couple of years, Globi has been uh, making efforts to uh, digitize and make fair such data. What Globi does is uh, they mine species interactions from um, data sets and they uh, represent semantically the data inside their own infrastructure, which enables querying and visualization of, of species interactions. And uh, this is a really, um, a really uh, recent um, example of, of how Globi um, um, indexes interactions. Uh, apart from the interaction itself and the interacting species, Globi also records the reference from where the interaction has been uh, extracted. So how does Globi find um, datasets to index? 
the first way is through manual suggestions and uh, I'll show you a screenshot of actual communication from the COVID-19 task force Slack group in which um, a paper is suggested to contain uh, interesting interactions data and then Yorit from, from Globi can uh, contact the author and ask to index uh, their data set. However, it's important to note that the author should make available their uh, data on GitHub or Zenodo. So you see here an actual extracted interaction from that very same paper and uh, the species interacting in that um, interaction are actually linked to other uh, repositories and infrastructures. So this is the beauty of FAIR data. Uh, we have links between resources. And uh, the other way via which Globi finds and indexes interactions is automatically through IPTs or our living collections. Um, so what about publications? Uh, what about this kind of uh, interactions which are locked within the narrative of text? And uh, Globi, Pensoft and Platzi joined forces to find ways to actually extract interactions from publications. And of course, this was a post-publication effort. So after the, the uh, narrative was already published. And uh, here I'll talk about three separate workflows for indexing interactions from Pensoft. And the first one is really highly automated. It's through uh, I, the Darwin Core archives, which are linked to Pensoft publications. And uh, this they can be uh, accessed through Pensoft's IPT, after which Globi has a really automated way to index and find such archives containing interactions. But to speed up the process, we actually looked for archives which contain the associate taxa column and this was uh, this practice was able to point us to archives which could potentially um, contain interaction data and via this workflow globi was able to index almost 35,000 interactions from 733 taxa so the second workflow the second workflow is a lot less automated and it concerns interaction of uh, extraction of interactions from uh, comma separated value tables and they are actually attached to publications. In this example, you see a table from the biodiversity data journal uh, in which uh, are recorded uh, associations or interactions between bird taxa and mite species. And you see this example of a really well-constructed table. It's uh, what we call rectangular table because the number of the columns is equal in each row. Um, so here, actually Globi doesn't need to do a lot of um, schema parsing. However, um, in other cases, there are some merged rows and merged columns. So uh, Globi needs to do a lot of manual work to transform the table schema to a schema which it can understand to index the interactions. And something else that should be noted is that in each cell containing a scientific name, uh, it has to be expanded to several more columns, it, uh, one containing the genus name and another one containing the species name. So there's a lot of table handling which uh, needs to occur and Globi has developed uh, a special uh, profile for such Pensoft tables, enabling uh, to extract uh, interactions from a lot of a lot of different kind of tables. And this on the left is an example of an extracted um, interaction as seen on uh, Globis website from this very same paper. So finally, the third workflow, the most complicated one concerns extraction of interactions from the actual narrative of the articles. So it doesn't concern extraction from uh, structured CSV files, but this time it's from XML. 
So uh, since Bansoft is a semantic publisher and a lot of its uh, biodiversity journals are published in the semantic XML format, these articles, which are um, in XML, get transformed to linked open data and are stored in the open biodiv knowledge base. Therefore, uh, we were able to uh, get only these, these sections of the articles which concern us, which are the tables. After that, we were able to annotate the content of the tables with a tool we developed called the Pensoft Annotator. And I'm actually presenting about it uh, in a couple of minutes, but uh, what the Pains of Annotator does is it annotates um, free texts with ontologies. And we used uh, the, a customized version of the relations ontology to find terms signifying biotic interactions within those tables. So um, in this way, we were able to detect which tables could be potentially containing such interactions um, so there were thousands of tables, but we identified, identified a couple of hundred of them. And then uh, we recorded those tables as XML in a JSON file with all associated metadata and uh, made them available on GitHub from where Globi could find and index them. So this workflow also requires table parsing and if it, it's even more complicated because XML files can also contain merged columns and merged rows and uh, Globi needs to do the same, the same kind of expansion. Um, but also it should be noted that the tables contain annotated uh, or marked up species names. So um, Globi actually um, can resolve the full taxonomy of names by querying the open biodiv knowledge base for the identifiers found in the tables to find out what is the full taxonomy of a name. And uh, together with the DOI, it can also be used to query open biodiv for the uh, full metadata record of an article. So as you can see, this is a really complicated workflow and uh, it had some mixed results because even, even though um, Globi has developed ways to um, make tables rectangular and to extract the interactions from them, we still cannot determine what's the directionality of the interaction. So in a host pathogen interaction, we, we don't really know which species is the host and which is the pathogen as it is in, uh, as it is, uh, in this case, because um, there is really no way to tell automatically just from the table. And uh, sometimes this is indicated in the table caption, but all of this requires human effort to determine and then to record. So that's why Globi puts this interacts with statement instead of the actual biotic interaction, because we, we cannot say whether it's a host, host of or pathogen of. And then we, we hypothesize that some uh, natural language processing methods can be used uh, like machine learning or uh, extrapolating based on patterns. And these methods can be used to determine what's the direction of an interaction, but this requires a lot of uh, data, a manual, manually curated corpus and a lot of time for people to sit down and determine um, text patterns. So we thought, isn't there another way and uh, there is another way, it is to shift the effort during uh, pre-publication. So Pensoft developed this uh, linked data table template to enable authors to create fair data in the first place. And uh, it's um, actually a Google Sheets template that authors can fill in and this allows them to link their data to existent identifiers or vocabularies and this to make it fair. And you can read more about it in this uh, blog post on Pensoft's blog. But here is an example from Zookeys. And this is an article in which specimen vouchers are linked to um, genomic sequences and to scientific names and geographic coordinates. So 
if we imagine that this table also uh, contains interactions data, uh, we can um, imagine two other columns. Uh, the first one would be containing the type of interaction and the uh, in the actual Google Sheets template, you can select from a drop down menu from all of the available uh, interaction types, which are in the relations ontology. Uh, so the author has to just click uh, which interaction is occurring and then they should uh, also write or record the target species or which is the other species uh, participating in this interaction. Uh, so this, as you can see, is a much more elegant approach towards making data fair. And even though it requires more effort from the authors, they are preparing spreadsheets anyway. So- Yeah, Maria, uh, there's two minutes left. Okay, so we think that if, um, if they actually make a little bit more effort in, in the pre-publication stage, uh, if they utilize the table uh, template, data can be created fair instead of made fair, which is a lot more complicated. And actually, this was the end of my presentation. And I'd like to thank the European Union for funding my PhD. Uh, thank you. And if you have any questions, um, you can ask them. Okay. So, Maria, <clears throat> the question is to use a vocabulary of interactions, relations ontology or something else. So we use a modified version of the relations ontology. What that means is that we selected only a subset of terms. Uh, re referring to biotic interactions, since not the relations ontology contains other terms which are not uh, of interest to this uh, workflow. And uh, what we also did was we customized it by expanding and adding additional synonyms or different word forms of the species interactions. Uh, and the Pensoft annotator actually allows to upload a custom ontology. So we were able to do that. Is the tool available to the public? Someone asked and yes, it's available. Uh, maybe, maybe I can post a link to, to it in the chat or it's also, there's also a link in the abstract uh, of this presentation. And I forgot, uh, no, actually, I'm talking about the annotator now. But if you, that's what you're asking about, yes, it's available. And I'll present about it in a few minutes. So um, will it be possible in the future to have interactions mentioned in a paper linked automatically? Mm. So this is after publication or I'm assuming yes, if it's after publication, this can be done if we, um, if we annotate the text with the same relations ontology, I guess. Um, okay. Do you have, do you handle instances of interactions as well as observations of interactions with date, time, location? Uh, so, no, but this can be done because a lot of the times uh, tables like this or the materials examined sections contain rich metadata concerning dates and times and so on. Again, it's up to the authors of about how, how much metadata they provided in the first place. Okay, thank you, Maria. We now switch to our next speaker, Frank Michel. He will talk about unleash the potential of your website.
180,000 web pages from the French Natural History Museum marked up with bioschema slash schema.org biodiversity types. Uh, thank you, Danette, and hi, everybody. Um, so uh, just to start this talk, I will just, yeah, to try to ask a very naive question, which is this, how, how to share your biodiversity data, or how we, do we do that? There are basically lots of different, different solutions to do that, ranging from very simple to more sophisticated ones. Uh, so maybe the most simple one would be web pages, and then you, get, you would get maybe flat files that you would made available somewhere. Uh, if you're a bit more of a techie, you would possibly uh, publish a web API on top of your database and uh, possibly create a knowledge graph using the linked data practices and so on. And if you go further, well, maybe you would follow a more integrative approach and push your data to GB for to some portals like EOL or iDigBio. Uh, the thing is, the more sophisticated the approach, the more, uh, say, uh, uh, expensive it is in terms of workflow and uh, on, on workload and technical skills. And not everybody has the manpower and skills to push their data to GB for maybe even just to publish a web API. Uh, and it, it turns out that web pages are maybe often the most common way to, of publishing data and let people know about your data. Uh, the problem is that web pages are mostly, well, hardly structured data, and this hampers the integration with other data sources. So, uh, fortunately, there are some initiatives to tackle this issue, and uh, you, you have already probably heard about uh, uh, Schema Dialog, which is basically uh, a community project founded initially by a, a few little startups that you may have heard of. These are Yahoo, Google, Bing, and Yandex. Um, and the whole point of Schema.org is to define vocabulary to market resources on the internet at large. So on the internet, that means web pages, but not only that, could be emails and, and even other types of resources. Uh, but anyway, the, the point is to, to be able to embed in your with your resources, so typically in your web pages, some structured data that search engines can understand better. And they will use this structured data to rank your resources, your web pages, and make them more discoverable and maybe provide more informative summarizations in the real result list that you will get. Um, now, the good thing is that schema.org is extensible by nature, and bioschema is one of those extensions. Um, the, the whole point of Bioschema, so it's, it's also a large community project involving people from, from many different areas. Uh, the, the whole idea is to improve uh, the discoverability and interoperability of life science resources. So uh, the, main, the main approach is to extend Schema.org with possibly new terms when this is necessary, but keeping it simple. That is, uh, the point is not to uh, restart yet another large uh, domain ontology about genes or, or proteins or biodiversity concepts. It's really to remain at a rather high level of abstraction and a level where, let's say, there would be consensus and you would not get into uh, experts' debates. Uh, and on top of that, uh, bioschemas provide guidelines about how to annotate the resources, how to, what are the best practices to do that? And these are what we call profiles. So profiles will typically give you an idea of what are the minimum properties that you should uh, state about a resource, what we call the minimum uh, properties, and there are recommended or optional properties. And it, it will also try to link and connect to existing vocabularies and domain ontologies so that we don't reinvent the wheel all the time. Um, so, in the uh, bioschemas community, there is a biodiversity group, and we have started with uh, these two, uh, th this term. The, so we have started with two terms, basically, taxon and taxon name. Um, taxon here is, is, you have the specification that's displayed here. In red, you can see the existing properties in schema.org, and in uh, green, these are new properties that have been added, which are taxon rank, parent, and child taxon. Uh, and uh, two properties for the scientific names. So um, what you, you can also notice here that there, there is here, for instance, a uh, Darwin core property uh, about the vernacular names. So this is where we do this kind of link with existing other uh, vocabularies. Um, now, 
you can see also that there we have an, we, we are using existing properties like name and alternate name. Name will be used to denote the valid or accepted name of a taxon and the alternate name will be used to denote the synonyms. So we, we try to make as much po as possible with what exists and just, just coin new properties when that's needed. Now, uh, in the discussions we had in, we, with the community, soon enough we discussed the need of a taxon name type uh, and there are several reasons to that. The, the first one is that some portals and databases are specifically taxonomic named registries uh, like Zobank or IPNI. So having a taxon type was not sufficient for them. Plus names are generally less subject to interpretations than taxa. Uh, and uh, overall, we uh, estimated that having two terms, taxon and taxon name was sufficient to cover a broad range of use cases, yet simple enough to avoid uh, hurting domain experts. Well, hopefully. Uh, and here in, in this, uh, on, on the slide, you can see here on the right, this is a link to the GitHub issue where we have discussed uh, the need for that type. And there are quite a lot of comments from different people, including myself and, uh, and Quentin and maybe other people who are connected today here. Um, okay, so now bioschemas has worked so far. Well, our biodiversity group has worked so far on taxon and taxon name. That's, that could be just the beginning. So in the future, we could, uh, imagine discussing new terms or profiles about how to describe a specimen, traits, occurrence, and all in all of these cases, we could try to connect with existing terms like ABCD and open uh, uh, digital specimen and trace ontologies and so on. Okay, so now uh, the taxon and taxon name uh, terms that I just defined, explained are not yet part of schema.org. Uh, but we have an early deployment, which is uh, something that we've done with the National Museum of Natural History in Paris. Um, so basically, this is a, a, an existing web page of the, of the museum. And what we have done is to embed within this page some additional piece of script, which is in uh, uh, JSON-LD. And basically, this, this part of script, which is here uh, showed using the Google Structured Data Testing Tool, it shows that, uh, well, you can see that there are additional types that have been provided name, which is the scientific name, alternate names that are the synonyms of that taxony, taxonomic name and so on. So we have tried to uh, apply as much as possible the bioschema's recommendation about those taxon and taxon name terms. Um, and uh, overall, now we have uh, over 180,000 pages that are marked up this way. Um, now, note that this is relatively inexpensive. I mean, uh, when you do this kind of, when you have a website like this one, you basically have a process that will read information from your database and then build the web page on the fly. Uh, now, adding some information, hidden information in your web page in like a JSON LD script or RDFA, or whatever, well, this is relatively simple. You already have the workflow, you already have the data. So that's not very costly. And I really thank the people from the, the museum to have followed us on that, because this is having early deployment is very important to the community. The thing is that um, for schema.org to move forward with the endorsement of new terms, it is important that the community shows its interest in having such terms. So uh, having one such website annotated with those, ter with those terms, just one is not really useful. The interest comes when there are many people doing that. So now imagine that uh, many people follow follow us on this, and uh, that GB and UL and all these big uh, integrative portals uh, start doing the same thing. But then maybe also museum collections that are, have a website, but maybe not integrated in IDIC Bio. Uh, the literature uh, references like BHL or Platzi that was just presented and Pensoft work uh, with Globby. And maybe there are lots of other websites that you hardly know about, like citizen science platforms, other institutions and uh, civil society associations and so on. So if all of these people start publishing their data on, the webs on, on their website with those markup data, when, well, we start opening up the large uh, scope of opportunities. And now it's not just about uh, using search engines, but it's much more than that. We can imagine creating registries of such resources and uh, aggregators that will scrape the web pages and aggregate data that into 
uh, databases and maybe link data databases and so on. And, and that we already have tools to do that, by the way. Uh, this is already part of what uh, Bioschema has provided. Uh, and uh, we can imagine lots of other scenarios of application exploiting all of this information. Uh, so uh, just to finish on that, that uh, you understand my message here. It's that marking up web pages is cheap and it can pay off like really big. Uh, it can increase discoverability of your resources, your web pages, it can increase its visibility. But there's not only what's already on your web pages, but maybe more like imagine what's what we call gray science, which is usually uh, an, uh, unpublished data, unpublished technical reports, all of the things that usually stay on your computer but are never published. Well, you can start publishing them and make advertise them with taxonomic structured data on the on the web. And 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 then, well, uh, I'm I'm going to be a bit provocative here, but then maybe we can have search engines do the job for us. What I mean is do the job of data integration at web scale. I mean, those, those search engines yield, harvest the web all, all the time, and they are very powerful in doing that. If we give them the way of crossing the data, understanding the data, and connecting, connecting it from one website to another, it can be extremely powerful. Now you can even connect that with uh, data search engines, such as the Google search engine, and maybe others that will follow. So. Uh, probably we have lots of opportunities that, that could uh, see that could appear in the future based on on this kind of approach. And uh, this is it for me. Thank you. And maybe there's going to be a few. Thank you, Frank. Questions. But, uh, yes, there are some questions. Um, so one is, which seems to be, is what we do with ephemeral web pages or web pages done on the fly. What do we do? Sorry, with. What to do with web pages which are dynamic? Well, precisely. When they are dynamic, it's very easy to add something within it. So it's it's even more easy because you do what, what you want. So that's the case of, uh, I, I just presented with the, the example of the Museum of Paris. Their pages are dynamic. Their, the website is backed by a database. So they build the pages on the fly. And on the fly, we add a piece of JSON-LD data that makes the, this annotation. So I would say it's even easier to do it when it's dynamic than when it's static. I'm not sure if this answers the question or... Ah, um, good question. More, yeah. Can you see the questions? Uh, yeah, well, maybe I have to... Or how does schema.org cooperate with other uh, similar cases uh, like in Wikidata? For example, on, on this issue on taxon name. So what do you mean with Wikidata? I mean, do, do, does Wikidata collaborate with schema.org to do this kind of thing? That's the question. Yes. I'm not sure on this. Uh, yeah, that's to be checked. I, I'm not sure, honestly. Um, Wikidata and, DB and Wikipedia are two big worlds and they're maybe feel uh, self-sufficient so it's not always easy to have them you know uh, collaborate with other big initiatives of integration but well that's one point of view so i'm not sure here honestly to answer um the question concerning scratch pad and vibrant pages should be the the statement is there should be easy to integrate into schema but where is the respective search engine uh, I'm not sure what vibrant pages are, scratch pad. Mm. So if you talk about mm, pads that are co-edited uh, by people, um, how would you add some annotations of the web pages that contains the editor? I'm not sure here. Um, should be integrated into schema. Or, well, the, the question is more, how do you integrate schema.org or bioschema's annotation within the existing web pages? It's most in this way. Um, does Google see the bioschema's markup? So yes, uh, although for now, like I said, the terms are not endorsed officially by schema.org. Um, so if you test the web pages of the museum right now with the Google test structured testing tool, it will, raise some errors because it says uh, taxon and taxon name do not exist. They didn't, do not exist for now, but as soon as they exist, they, they're going to be understood properly. And that's that's the whole point. So 
for now, no, but that, that's the, the the whole point of doing this this whole approach. And that's also the whole point of having deployments that show the use of those terms. And it will say, maybe uh, encourage schema.org to move forward in the endorsement of those terms. <coughs> Sorry. How expensive is it if Google and others start crawling your 180,000 web pages were not more ex expensive than what it was before? I mean, the web pages existed before. It's just that now there's a little bit more information within it, but Google was already indexing those pages before. So it doesn't change a lot here. Um, so the question, dynamic pages are rendered by client-side JavaScript. How do you imagine dealing with these pages? Mm, okay, well, you can imagine having, well, when you generate a web page dynamically, so yeah, either it's generated by the server or by the client or both, which is now <coughs> most, mostly the case. Um, I think, well, what we have done for now with the museum is, uh, is to make this annotation on the server side because everything is generated on the server side, but you could do the same thing in, in your JavaScript. That is when you generate the data locally on the client, well, generate, not the data, the data comes from the server, but you, you generate the, the whole representation when you can easily add some RDFA tags in your uh, tabs or in your HTML tags and, and so on. So again, that's, that really, that's really a question of just a bit development to add information in the generation of what already exists. So this just improving a little bit the scripts, whether they are server side or client side. Another question is, is whether Google sees the bioschema markup? Uh, yeah, I think I, I uh, answered that uh, just before. So uh, like I said, it's, it sees it. And for now, it says the terms are not schema.org officially, which is right. But as soon as the term officially endorsed in schema.org, then, then th this is good. Have you been considering a, a bioschema org extension for Drupal? For Drupal? Drupal. Um, not that I know of, but OK, yes, that, that's an interesting question. Drupal or, or WordPress or whatever. Uh, when you use a CMS, uh, you have these plugins, uh, ECO plugins, to improve the uh, uh, search engine. How, is the, how What does it stand for, SEO? It's search engine optimization. What these plugins do is basically uh, to create uh, schema.org annotations in your web page, either in JSON-LD or in RDFA, it depends. Um, I'm not I, I don't know if with those plugins, you can add the annotations that you like. I think you can actually, there are a lot of things that are default, like what is your organization and author and, uh, and blah, blah, blah. But you can probably add some free uh, markers, free annotations. Uh, and even if we if you can do that, so that's going to be manual. Now, um, indeed, uh, we can imagine that developing plugins for most common CMSs that would specifically do address those needs could be could be really good because it would save a lot of time for web admins, webmasters. Okay, one last question is: What is the lightest weight way to consume the data you've produced in this example? Um, so there, there are several tools, but in the Bioschemas community, we, we have one tool that we are developing right now. It's called Bmuse, and uh, we have started to use it to scrape. So basically, you just give it as an input a list of URIs. It can be big, whatever, and it will uh, uh, download, download the page. It will execute any JavaScript that's in the page. So maybe that answers your, your question also, the question about JavaScript or server side. So it will just uh, render the page and then scrape all of the bio schemas annotations that are inside and, and generate uh, a knowledge graph, an RDF knowledge graph. And then you would do what you want with that. So, uh, about biodiversity uh, terms, there are 
we, we have not so much played with it yet. I know that in other groups of, of bioschemas, uh, there are uh, proteins and gene terms. They have made quite a lot of, uh, of, of works here to not only have live deployment, but scrape the data at large. Uh, so I, I know there are ongoing experiments here and that, that would be very easy to replicate on, on the bio, uh, biodiversity terms. Okay, Frank, thanks very much. Thank With you. That, we change to our next speaker, Marcus Guidotti, who will talk about the standards behind the scenes, explaining the data from the PLASI workflow. Okay. I think my screen is shared now. Can you see it? Yep. Okay. So um, I think, uh, I like to think that my talk is filling the gaps from Donut's talk because the idea here is to, uh, as the title indicates, is to explain the data from Plazi and perhaps so, so some of the misconceptions that we, uh, not often, but we occasionally see from, from, from people. Um, I am a, a Plazi member, I'm a data scientist and I'm based on Brazil. I'm also a taxonomist. So whenever I have the chance to talk about Plazi data, I like to present in simpler known technical terms because I am, more interested in making my my colleagues to understand what we do and the importance of what we do than anything else. So that's what I'm attempting in this talk. Uh, this is one slide that you already saw in the first talk if you, if you were here before. Essentially, we are showing how connected the Plaza data is uh, right now. Um, there are different uh, players, applications and data gathers and um, uh, places where you can visualize and access this data. Uh, of course, uh, to make this possible, we export different formats as well. Um, you also saw this slide before, and uh, essentially this is uh, an attempt to break down what the data actually are. So if you have one document, and this document can be an article or it can be a book or any anything related to the taxonomic field, you have some uh, specific information inside that perhaps we are more used to, like the metadata the images, uh, tables, and, and references, but you also have what we like to call the taxonomic treatment. And the taxonomic treatment have different sections as well. And this is the part that I like to explain a little bit more careful. Uh, we have sections like the description, which is um, the interpretation of that particular author of that particular taxon concept. Uh, we also have things like etymology, if it's a new name. Uh, and we have these two particular sections, which are perhaps the most important ones. The first is uh, treatment citations, and that Donna uh, briefly explained that and the importance I'm gonna show in the next slide, and also material citations, which was um, target of some of the questions and concerns on the chat if you're following. And that's also something important that I hope to briefly address here. And also, of course, treat, uh, taxonomic treatments will cite images, tables, and references too. So uh, the, better way, the best way to explain this is perhaps showing an actual example. And I, I took one from this uh, journal, uh, European Journal of Taxonomy, this particular paper, which has not only one, but several different taxonomic treatments. And this is one of these, the treatments uh, contained by this particular article. So you can see we have a taxonomic name uh, as, a, as the title of the treatment and, and below this, all the information related to that specific taxonomic name according to that specific author. So it's an interpretation of the author from this taxon concept. And you can have different sections here. Like I said before, you have the nomenclature section. I color code here so you can follow. Uh, you have figure citations. You also have the treatment citations, which are uh, citations of previously published treatments. And this kind of connection between treatments is what allow us to, or, or in fact, allow sinus species, which is one of, this uh, one of the applications that use our data to solve uh, which name is the valid one, which author uh, deprecated a specific name, which name is a synonym of the other name, and etc. cetera. It is, uh, the, the treatment citations is the part that we are connecting, that the authors connect the, the history be before that specific uh, contribution on that particular name. So that's that's why it's so important. And also we have the material citations, which as I said before, um, bring some cons uh, some concerns, especially when you're looking at the data from GPEF, 
But the idea here, and this is the particularly important to understand, the idea is this is a citation of a material, not the material itself. So material citations should not be taken as a, uh, an attempt to solve the digital specimen issue, which is something that we believe will enable us to connect literature with these specimens uh, themselves. But it should be seen as a citation of a particular specimen. And um, I think I, I, I answered privately because I was not trying to disrupt the, the other talks, but the idea behind is uh, these are citations. And um, I do think the, the GB feature should be targeted, and, and it is, as Donald announced. But it's important to understand that we are not attempting to create a digital specimen here, but uh, providing the citation of one. And then you also have different sections, as I said. In this case, I just bring the uh, read description. But it's important to understand that the entire thing is a treatment, because the, a treatment can be seen as the interpretation of an author of that particular taxon concept with all the information included in a particular paper. And uh, we believe that this is the unit of taxonomic work and uh, enabling treatments to be fair and by fair citable as well, it's one, one step uh, towards uh, data liberation for taxonomy. Um, here we are back to that slide and uh, we are showing the different connections of the, the plastic treatment again. And as I said, we, to, to accomplish this, we have to provide different file formats and different file formats also follow different vocabularies and standards. So for the first part, the part that everyone is used to, we use mods and jets. And for the tre taxonomic treatment part, we basically use TextPub we, and heavily use Darwin Core depending on the file format that we are exporting to. So, and you can see this in one important collaboration that we have, which is with Zenodo. And uh, here I'm, I'm bringing the same treatment to you. And uh, <clears throat> this treatment have several different metadata associated with, including the basic ones, which is the first part here on, um, on, on your left. <clears throat> and um, in the middle one, you can see some custom metadata fields, which were only possible because of Darwin core terms. So we can actually, see taxonomic ranks and uh, and the identification of that particular treatment on the left on on the right one you can see uh geographical data that were available uh from uh, the paper and also all the possible different file formats that we can export the same data and now if you click in any one of these uh, this will become a query on zenodo and uh, you can see here on the query uh, url that we are actually using darwin cortons behind scene and from that, if you click on the family, like I did, you can find uh, another 222 treatments on this particular family. Of course, this is a very uh, large family and probably we target some, some important papers on this. You're not gonna find the same amount, but perhaps you're gonna find even more if you, if you try to search by, for your taxon of interest. We also did something uh, slightly different for the Setaf COVID task force. Uh, besides extracting treatment from bad literature, we did extract some virus host interactions from specialized literature, but with a different, completely different approach and, and completely manually. And we did manually because first we are trying to understand the data that we had at hand. And uh, from our experience, the data on this uh, specialized literature, more genetic, uh, genomic literature and, and things like that is not very taxonomic. Uh, accurate. So, so most of times we have verbatim names only for hosts. Um, the data, the, the association between the interactions between the host and virus is not structured in a way, but uh, it, it imposes several challenges like Maria uh, described it. And, uh, <clears throat> but we did, and we did also following a standard, uh, the relation ontology, which also became a custom metadata on Zenodo. And because of that could be harvested and used by Globi which you can see, uh, uh, this is the Zenodo uh, page of one particular article that we worked with. Uh, here you can see all the interactions that we extracted and all of them are clickable links because they became queries on, on Zenodo. So we can actually query Zenodo for one particular host or one particular virus or one particular relationship and get all the articles that are citing that. And uh, this is also found on, on Globil. And uh, here I have just highlighted the same DOI to show that some of these relationships are actually being supported or corroborated by different uh, papers as well. 
uh, as Donald said before, uh, Plazi is funded by Arcadia, which allows us to build not only part of this infrastructure, but also the community support, uh, which is in place right now. And uh, this is something fairly recent. And uh, we receive feedback from, from users and try to act upon the issues that they raised. Uh, one example from previous week was something that we received from GBEEF and that we could, for the first time, act in the same day because we have this channel now. So that's something that Arcadia is, is also uh, enabling us to do for the first time, which is great. Uh, thank you. I think I was too fast. Thank you, Marcos, for these uh, explanations. Um, I'm very happy we sparked a discussion about the basis of record and material citations. Yeah, I did the mistake to leave the chat open, so I was just looking at the all the questions <laughs> popping up here. But, uh... Should I just pick one or? Yeah, I mean, the, the basis of record seems to be a very important one. Yes, uh, this one. So uh, Erica Krimo uh, shared a link before on your talk or after your talk. And I think that link is very uh, interesting because it's a different channel of discussion. And I think this is something that we have to discuss internally. If there is something that we can do by changing the terms that we are using, I would definitely vote for it. But uh, in a way, I think the goal with my talk is essentially to explain the difference between a material citation and an actual specimen. So what a museum provides to GBIF is the actual specimen and perhaps should be a digital specimen someday. So that's why we are looking forward to this kind of discussion as well, the implementation of them. Uh, but our data is, it, it, it must be taken as a material citation, as a, as a citation of that specimen. And uh, we should definitely look into how to make it this look different on, on GB for any other application that uses the data. That's my, my take on it. Okay, the question is, any idea of the percentage of new species published for which the data are liberated from PDF present, PDF present at present? A new species published for which the data. So uh, annually, we, we are close to 50% of the zoological species. And uh, we, but the, but the problem with this, in my opinion as well, is that we don't have a very strongly reliable source of information on how many species are published. We are relying on zoological records. I did some analysis on the data from zoological records based on specific keywords. And we also look at the zoo record, zoo, zoo bank, and, uh, but the difference is, is striking. So it's hard to have a one single data set that we can point and say, this is the amount of species that we are targeting. But from these sources, we are uh, very close to 50% of the new species published every year for the zoological uh, road. Uh, for, the, for botanical, we have some specific challenges to overcome, especially with treatment citations because they do have a different way to provide this. And, and this also is some, something that I think it's worth mentioning. But uh, although taxonomic literature is fairly structured, you can see like you, you can define a treatment based on those structures. You have a, a nomenclature section, you have that heading and et cetera. The way the information is inside of it is a mass. And sometimes if you have a different graphic editor in the same journal for the same volume, you might have a different spacing and that will challenge the automation of the process of the data extraction process. So um, sometimes we have some issues with this. So, so that's why it's so important to get this feedback loop so we can solve it, understand, and also try to automate the solution. But specifically, uh, talking specifically about the question, botany is something that we didn't touch that much yet. And um, the microbiology world is something that is more easy to target because they, they, they all publish in the same journal because by a, by a code rule. And uh, we are looking at that into that right now. Uh, that's on the pipeline. Okay. Have you considered looking for other nomenclatorial acts such as lecture typification? Typification. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand. What can you can you give me an example of what you're saying? Yes, the, the answer is yes, we're looking into this. 
we are trying to find a way we can actually model that and and and, and make use of this. So it's in a in a development phase. I'm actually not finding that many questions, but more comments on the on the terms. So Marcus, do you believe with your experience now, how far can we go with automating, creating a catalog of life by machine? Pretty far, to be honest. Um, and the reason why is uh, during this year that we worked, uh, I, uh, my involvement with PLUS is one and a half year. So we have helped uh, to develop GGI, the Golden Gate, uh, the, the, the program behind this, this data extraction, which is uh, made by Guido Salter, he's in the audience, uh, very well. Like, I think we, we move forward and we can now uh, deal with most of the journal layouts, especially the born digital literature. The second phase will be uh, looking into the OCR literature, which is, uh, as Donald also explained, uh, we have, uh, we are deeply interested and in especially uh, the BHL uh, data as well. So this is a second phase for us, but the first phase, which is perhaps in 20 years or so of data, it's something that we can very, very well extract. And uh, that's what we are doing. We have uh, over 6,000 uh, PDFs in, in the pipeline waiting for, for to, to be processed. And this processing is, uh, is perhaps abled by the, the, the construction of templates that teaches the software how that, that how the information is displayed on that particular journal or even better on that particular layout of that particular journal, which can change uh, over time and also can change over the article type. So I, I'm, I'm pretty op optimistic about it, to be honest. Uh, OCR, different, different story, but I, I think we are starting to look into that direction as well. So how much do you think this process you're involved can be scaled up? I mean, imagine we have like together, I mean, only uh, there are 50 million pages waiting to be processed at DHL. Do you think there's a chance to do this? Yeah, honestly, yes. Uh, but I do think the it's important to keep a feedback loop and a channel of uh, manual creation when needed. It's not, it's not always needed. And uh, we, we do have a very strict quality control in place. We are not uh, exploring data that we don't actually trust right now. We have so, uh, several different quality checks. And uh, this is something important because it can point to us which document need manual, manual attention. So uh, keeping that uh, is something that we, we should keep in mind. But uh, the amount of pages and, and articles is not something that actually scare me. Uh, it's a lot, of course it's a lot, but uh, the automation, I think we can say that the automation is, is working and, uh, and that's something that it's very, uh, it makes me very happy actually. Uh, but we do, we, we do need to keep this feedback loop as just like with the link uh, Erica said or the, or the GB post on our repository for that, that this helps us to understand the data and to correct things in an automa automate way, but also to provide uh, actual good data to, to the end users. So what, what, with your experience, what would you suggest to publishers to change, to make it easier to extract well, it's always, data it's, from, from publications, unless they really change to XML publishing, which would be preferable, but yeah, other uh, reminder who keep, keep publishing PDFs. If they don't do XML, then we need a fairly structured PDF. And by that, I mean a different heading, with different font, font properties and a very standard spacing um, and also a very standard way to present the material citation part and the treatment citation part, which this is the two most important sections and perhaps the two most variable sections which change uh, from author to author. So uh, if, you can, if the publisher can guarantee that uh, the automation of the extraction will be also guaranteed. So the, I would go along these lines, uh, some, some guidelines towards uh, 
more structure and different font sizes and font properties for different heading levels and etc. A last question. We hope we can bridge the gap between publications and digital and, digital and specimens. So how, how, how do you see is this happening? How many publications we get do we include persistent identifiers for specimens? That's not many way less than I would like to admit. And um, that's something that I was exposed to because when, as a taxonomist and, and working on my own publications, I, I learned this very early on that it was important to add, but it's not something very often found. And uh, sometimes, the way, again, the way the data is presented, sometimes you have several specimens that are in the same code or in a code with an iPhone, and, and this is always complicated to make sense out of in an automatic process, but it's possible. So um, I definitely would like to see more uh, taxonomists using this kind of unique identifier. So we can, um, we will be able to at least one day make the connection between the digital specimen and the material citations. Okay, Marco, Marco, I think that I will thank you very much for your contribution. We now switch to back to Maria. And this time she talks about the paints of annotator, a new tool for text annotation with ontology terms. You have to on. Yeah. Um, there you go. Thank you. So hello again, everyone. Um, this time I'm presenting about the tool that I mentioned in the previous presentation, the Pensoft Annotator. And here are listed uh, my colleagues from Pensoft, Georgi, Theodor, and my PR, Lubomir. Uh, and um, Georgi was really involved in the creation of this tool. So I thank him also. Uh, and so a lot of biodiversity information like interactions is uh, in spreadsheets and local databases, but some of it is in literature. And whereas spreadsheets and databases can easily be integrated into uh, existing repositories, um, and thus they can become part of the FAIR data realm. Um, narrative from scholarly literature is not really data, it's just text. So um, one question we had is, can we transform this narrative into um, uh, FAIR facts, uh, into facts that can be FAIR data? And um, that can be understood not only by humans, but also by machines. So uh, we try to approach this task and we created the, the Pensoft Annotator. And what the Pensoft Annotator is, is a web application which uh, matches free text to ontology terms. Um, and um, it does so on the basis of uh, basic text matching, but it um, has an optimized uh, uh, algorithm to match words and phrases from text to labels from ontology for, for ontology terms. Uh, and it also has an API for programmatic access. So uh, one can integrate the annotator inside their own text and data mining workflow. And uh, it allows annotation with multiple ontologies at the same time. So in this uh, example, I've only shown the environment ontology, but uh, the user can select multiple ontologies from the drop down menu and it allows annotation with custom ontologies so this is something that we did in the previous for the previous presentation we annotated tables with our own custom subset of the relations ontology and users or anyone is encouraged to create their own um, ontologies and by ontology we mostly mean a vocabulary, but uh, I say ontology because the, the formats that are used are the same as for the ontologies. So it's uh, OBO files or uh, all, all files and so on. Um, so anyone can create their own custom ontology and annotate with it, but they need to send a request to us so we can upload it. And uh, one question you might be asking yourself is, so what can be done with this annotator? Why is this useful? And uh, it's mostly useful for text and data mining tasks 
where uh, information can be extracted from text. And let's say we had the following research question. What specimens have been found in rivers that do not flow directly into the sea? And uh, let's say we had a collection of, of texts, perhaps treatments or more specifically uh, distribution sections where we would have some uh, specimen uh, records like uh, the specimen ID, but also location information. And we can extract from the text using the annotator what sections of, uh, of a treatment may be of interest to us in the text mining task. And uh, you can see here what um, results the annotator returns. So in this example, which is a real example from a Pensoft article, it matches the two terms from the environment ontology. Uh, and uh, you can see there's like a, an options to remove terms. This is because uh, you can download the results as a tab separated value file. So if you don't want it to be included in the, in the file, you can remove it from the front end. Uh, also, the results show the position of the term inside the text, which can also be useful if you are doing some enhanced text and data mining and you are interested in each of the words separately. And it also returns information about whether the term is a class or a property and which ontology it comes from. Um, so this is an example of how this can be used, but it's just the front end. So the same thing can be done using the API and the Pensoft annotator can be included in your own pipeline to include other um, tools. So how does that fit into the text and data mining approach? Um, similarly to other methods, the annotator can be used together with parts of speech tagging and named entity recognition to enhance our understanding of what's in the text, so the semantics of it. And the annotator kind of provides the same function as named entity recognition because we are able to detect not just words, but entities within the text. And uh, this is kind of limitless named entity recognition because we're only limited by what's in the ontology, whereas standard named entity recognition uh, provided by um, Stanford's uh, tools usually refers to people, locations, uh, organizations, and so on. So here we have more possibilities. And these kind of approaches can be used together to analyze text and to extract additional information, but also to do topic modeling, which is to model uh, what kind of teams are explored in the text. So um, if we want to categorize texts based on the contents, then we can create uh, systems to recommend content. And this, this is useful for science, like the, the publishing side of science, but also can be useful for uh, non-science um, tasks. But of course, uh, this is not really of interest. So. Um, Finally, I wanted to compare the Pensoft annotator to existing tools. And one such tool is the BioPortal annotator, which is developed by the BioPortal website. And they provide sort of like an ontology data browser or a database where you can look for ontologies based on ontology terms and you can browse ontologies. I encourage you to check it out if you're interested in that. And uh, their annotator allows users to annotate with any of the ontologies available on the website, which are all valid and versioned. Uh, in contrast, we have a lot less ontologies uploaded yet, but we'll, we will upload more. And uh, we also have a versioning mechanism but what's uh, most interesting is that option for a custom ontology upload because we don't really concentrate on the logical validity of an ontology. We kind of view it more like a vocabulary list. Um, so we're more interested in 
um, what possibilities uh, lie in that ontology, then how terms are connected to one another. Um, so another thing, another difference is the types of parameters enabled in both um, tools. So the BioPortal has a really extensive list of parameters. You can exclude numbers from the text matching, or you can exclude, you can match partially, but it doesn't have a stop word exclusion. And stop words are the most common words in the human language, in the English language, like pronouns, for example. Um, so to our knowledge, they don't provide that. But this can be useful in some cases when you don't want to uh, to annotate the full text, you want to exclude some words. We support that option and we provide a default list of stop words common in the English language. And the user can also provide their own and add to the list or add their own list. And finally, the speed. So we compare the server uh, time and also the uh, content download time and the, the pencil of the annotator is faster um, than the BioPortal with like 10 times. However, we, we know that this is not the, an objective indicator of, of performance since we don't know <clears throat> the server capabilities of the other tool. And someone asked whether we can um, annotate or find interactions within large uh, large uh, amount of texts. And this is exactly what the Pensoft annotator would help with. So how does it fit in with the Pensoft ecosystem? We are currently um, annotating texts published uh, by Pensoft uh, with the Pensoft annotator and the Envo ontology. And we, we want to semantically enhance texts with terms from Envo. And I think this would help us to kind of um, compile uh, articles mentioning uh, the same type of habitats. So this can be really useful in different ecological uh, research studies. And this provides further possibilities for information extraction. But to do what was mentioned in, in the comment about extracting a lot of interactions from text, there needs to be a lot of a lot of work to kind of um, to not just annotate with terms, but to uh, analyze the results, the text. And um, but this tool really gives us a lot of opportunities to do that. And thank you. Um, now I'm open to answering questions. So, <clears throat> Maria, when using the annotator as a service, do you store and keep the text which are uploaded? Uh, do we store the text? No, we don't store them. Yes, but if you use text, you can download them as a CSV files, the text you have annotated. That was the question of Anton. Uh, yes, you can save the text in the CSV file, but we don't we don't save all of the texts which were annotated uh, for every user. But you keep the annotations then, you store them. Uh, the annotations, no, we don't store them. So we've what we did with annotating with envo we store them because that's what we want to do so the annotator is just one part one small part of this workflow we only use it to annotate and then we, the pipeline then goes on to save the annotation in our mongodb database but this is because that's how we developed it it's it doesn't save annotations um just the annotator doesn't save them So that means the, the the way understand 
the annotator is a, a tool that anybody can use and contribute to, to uh, ultimately to open BioDiv. Or what is your view on how to, to, to uh, propagate or make use of the annotator? So, no, when people use it, they don't really contribute to open BioDiv because what they annotate is not safe there. Uh, but what we what we annotate currently, the workflow can be used to enrich open biodiv. And uh, the thing is that anyone can annotate anything. So we can't possibly allow um, automatic um, automatic saving of all the annotations in open biodiv, of course. So um, other applications can be built using the annotator and then these applications can <coughs> then be transformed to semantic data to linked open data okay. could annotate to support a workflow where i can share annotations with my group only until they are ready to be liberated um yes um, what do you mean only until they are ready to be annotated, to be liberated? Uh, the annotate, what is annotated is not public, so you can do whatever you want with the annotations. I don't know if that answers the question. And then someone asked, can the annotator be used for other languages than English? Um, I think if the ontology is not in English or the vocabulary is not in English, then it should work fine. So I don't see a problem with that, working with other languages than English. The annotator can only use text or can it also use image formats? No, only text. So it's based on just uh, plain text. If you have data in other types of formats, it's not gonna take it into account. So you, if you have XML, for example, and you want to annotate it, then you need to remove the markup to get any um, decent results. What would it take to turn this application to a near self-enclosed, self-sufficient JavaScript library? or perhaps a browser extension plugin? I don't think it's gonna take a lot, but it's not written. Yeah, it's, I'm not sure how much it would take since I think maybe Jorge should be able to answer that question, but he's not here now. So, uh, I mean, this can be done, but why would you want to create it into a library if you can just use it via the API? So, and it currently supports uh, get requests up to 2000 characters. And if someone wants to use it with larger texts without splitting them, then they can also contact us and ask us for um, collaboration. Okay. Is the annotator open source? Uh, the code for it is not open source, but it can be used openly. Could there be a future aligned with hypothesis? We haven't really looked into that, but we will, I think. And uh, yeah, definitely I'm gonna note this down. So, do you compare with similar work being done in the life science community, like what Elixir does, or in terms of like gene annotations or their own text and data mining exercises? We haven't really compared it with the work of Elixir. Um, I compared it with BioPortal because it's the most closest thing. And they are really similar, really. Um, 
and for our purposes, we use the PenSoft annotator because it's an in-house tool. Okay, I don't see any more questions here. I thank you, Maria, for this interesting talk. Our next speaker is Dima Mosserin, talking about adding taxonomic dimensions to the scientific names index in the biodiversity heritage library via integration with the catalog of life. Uh, hello, uh, can you see my screen? Hello, hello? Yes, we can hear it. Okay. Uh, so uh, this talk is about um, uh, how can we use uh, uh, a little bit of taxonomical, uh, taxonomical intelligence when we use uh, names in BHL. So uh, one thing that um, uh, Joel Richard talked yesterday uh, was uh, a new index for scientific names in BHL. Uh, the problem with old one was uh, it took us 45 days to finish it. And uh, uh, we couldn't do it again because nobody had 45 minutes, uh, days again. So uh, instead of that, we decided to speed it up and do it in one day, it happened. So now BHL can be, uh, uh, the index can be regenerated if not daily, but uh, in uh, quite, quite often. Uh, so as a result, we, uh, so when you do name finding, uh, it is based on uh, uh, three uh, programs. Uh, one uh, parses names, another one finds names in text, and the third one verifies names um, that we found. And uh, all three are open source uh, and uh, designed for end users, uh, not only for uh, BHL. So um, all of them are very fast. Well, I would say Gen Parser, Gen Finder are like really, really fast. Uh, Gen uh, verification is slower, but this should be fixed next year. Um, so why do we need speed? Um, we do not want to stop with BHL uh, in, fi in finding names. Uh, we also want to uh, index uh, everything. Uh, and uh, one experiment we did uh, last year was uh, to find names in the Hathi Trust digital library. Uh, it is about 40 times bigger than BHL and has, uh, according to some sources, uh, approximately 10% of all officially published literature. Um, and this, this experiment went well. So I think we are on a, a path to be able at least speed-wise uh, to index um, everything that we can uh, uh, get in uh, openly. Uh, so uh, we have names uh, in BHL again, <laughs> and uh, what can we do with it? Uh, so what, how can we make uh, this index more useful than just index? Uh, one thing that um, Elisa Herman said yesterday that it would be helpful for BHL uh, to connect vernacular names from different languages. So if people look for Lev or Lion, they uh, go to information in BHL about it. And this is uh, really useful for general public, uh, for uh, biodiversity scientists, probably scientific names are more important. And the things that uh, we cannot do at the moment is uh, to find the uh, information about a whole taxon, uh, not just for a name in BHL. Uh, uh, some uh, OTUs have uh, uh, quite significant number of synonyms and uh, uh, this information is not linked at the moment. Uh, it would be very helpful for many uh, to be able to uh, get uh, original descriptions uh, in BHL for, spe for species uh, or original uh, publication of new combinations. 
so like if I have uh, a name and uh, I have uh, a reference, uh, is this reference in BHL? And uh, if yes, where is it? Uh, and sometimes it can be useful just uh, uh, to find different name usages. Uh, for example, I am uh, I have a paper and uh, a paper reference, and I just want to know if it exists in BHL or not, and if does yes, uh, how to get to it. Um, so. Uh, so let's say, uh, how can we uh, do, um, how, uh, wh what can we do to add these, uh, like other dimensions or other functionalities to BHL? Uh, what we can do is, uh, uh, so we can uh, do it in four different, uh, four different ways, uh, either uh, we search just by name, uh, or from the name we get to a, uh, a taxon, and we search all information about this taxon in BHL. Uh, we uh, find the nomenclatural description of a name um, when we submit name and publication reference, or we find any kind of a publication in uh, BHL that uh, people are interested for some reason. So uh, we developed uh, uh, open source project called uh, BHL names. And the uh, idea behind BHL names is to provide this functionality. So uh, if you enter a name, uh, you can get uh, occurrences of the name and uh, metadata from BHL, but it's not exactly the same as it is now in BHL. We do clean uh, BHL data. So it is more concise, uh, more clean when, when it gets out. Uh, we also able to enter a name, uh, use a catalog of life uh, taxonomic data uh, to come from name to uh, taxon, uh, get all the synonymy and uh, search for all the synonyms, uh, get information for all of them. And we also able to uh, get a name uh, get a reference and uh, return back. Yes, we found this reference uh, and here is a page to it. Uh, we can do it for uh, original publications. We didn't do it for any publication yet, but that's not that hard. Um, we just need to exclude some of our anchors. Um, so what did we do uh, with the uh, uh, BHL data. Uh, we uh, removed some uh, noise uh, that uh, existed in uh, um, names and uh, we normalized uh, uh, BHL metadata significantly. Uh, so what, what does it mean? Uh, BHL has uh, three main layers. Uh, one layer is a title and the title can be uh, sort of abstract. For example, if there is a journal, journal has been around for 100 years, uh, that would be a title. An item would be a physical object usually that people scanned uh, and OCR. So that can be one volume of a journal or several of them bound together, uh, can be a book, um, like. Uh, whatever it is. And uh, another thing that is uh, uh, found uh, by people like Rod Page, for example, where uh, you find a, a particular uh, paper in the item and you say this paper goes from here to here. This is the authors, uh, this is pages, uh, this is a uh, title of the paper. Unfortunately, not all of them are marked yet. Uh, but there is already more than 200,000 of them. So progress is definitely huge compared to nothing. Um, and uh, uh, when we uh, work with all this data, uh, we do not want uh, to give people, uh, for example, 100 mentions of a name if they're all in the same item or if they all in the same uh, uh, paper. 
So we, uh, we decrease amount of occurrences. Uh, so we have one occurrence per uh, the, uh, the most granular part. Uh, for example, if you know there are two papers and two papers have a name, we give one name uh, occurrence per paper. But if there is also an item and this item that contains this uh, papers also contains the name, we also give this one occurrence. When we have a better gradation uh, for papers, we uh, can increasingly uh, have it more and more. Uh, another thing we do, uh, we try to make sense out of uh, pages, uh, years in BHL. They are mostly uh, kept as strings. Uh, they can have a very, very different uh, quality in the strings. Uh, sometimes it's great, sometimes it's not that great. So uh, we try to convert it into a data type that makes sense. Uh, so years and pages uh, become integers and uh, we use this data in, for uh, BHL names. Uh, also, uh, uh, we calculate uh, what this um, particular item is about. For example, if it is uh, mostly about mollusks, uh, we, uh, we will find that it is uh, uh, mostly has kingdom animalia and uh, the clay is mollusca that uh, for this particular um, uh, item. Uh, th that should help uh, to distinguish between historical homonyms that uh, people might already forget that they existed, but uh, we able to uh, point people that this seem to be wrong uh, journal for a name that you're looking for. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, so this is an example how it works uh, from the command line. Uh, so we run command, we try to find reference. Uh, we send uh, in a uh, scientific name, and uh, we get that it is a name that was found uh, currently, uh, according to Catalog of Life, accepted name is this one, uh, Trigonia Zulosa, and uh, uh, according to Catalog of Life, uh, those are synonyms of, that, of this name. Uh, just for fun, uh, <laughs> uh, pictures from Google for that, and the uh, number of uh, these cleaned up references uh, where everything is like one name per the most granular part. Um, and uh, uh, if you want to do it for name only, uh, the difference is significant. So we don't have synonymy, of course, because that's what we asked for. Uh, and we have only three references. So uh, from 95, we went to three. And this shows like amount of information that you would lose if you uh, use only um, a name uh, on, on its own. Uh, so another task is uh, how can we find the regional descriptions? Uh, so for that, we take a name string and we take uh, a reference and the publication uh, year. Uh, and uh, if we did not find anything that looks like this publication, we return nothing. Uh, if you did find something, uh, we return the, uh, something that scored the best. So we return one publication out of the HL. Uh, so here is an example. Uh, for example, we look for this particular name and we send in uh, this reference. Uh, BHL names goes through uh, BHL data and it finds that uh, on this page, there is a mention of this name with the spin-off. Uh, and as you see, we have also matching uh, reference string and volume. Uh, so how do we do it? Uh, we use anchors and anchors are currently only three. Uh, we use name string, obviously. Uh, we have a year of original publication and we use uh, annotation. Uh, we definitely can add more anchors. For example, uh, if uh, we able to create uh, like sort of canonical form of uh, 
uh, reference, uh, we should be able to find that this and this seem to be the same thing and connected together. Uh, and another thing that uh, people suggest is uh, uh, to figure out all the real pages uh, in uh, BHL uh, because pages work really great for finding uh, reference information together with other, uh, other things. So what is the problem uh, when we match it by year? Uh, so first of all, a year information, as I said, usually is kept as a string. And second, that it's not complete. Uh, quite a few times we do not have the information at all. Sometimes uh, it is wrong. Sometimes it is uh, spent through, let's say, 100 years if it is a long-term long journal uh, with no other information uh, available. Uh, and sometimes it's very granular. Uh, like if uh, we have uh, information about uh, an article, about a, a publication, uh, then we have exact year. Uh, so uh, we practically take the best year that is available and use it for the search. Uh, so what is the problem with uh, uh, annotations? Uh, <laughs> annotations are uh, not completely trivial to distinguish because uh, there is a, uh, just for SPNOF, uh, there is about more than 1,000, uh, 1,500 uh, different ways how we find it in BHL. And it's sometimes because of the uh, OCR and sometimes it is because uh, people are inventive. Um, so uh, one thing we tried to do is to match catalog of life to BHL. Uh, it took us about uh, one day, 28% uh, um, of BHL matched. Uh, out of that, uh, according to our estimation from 10 to 15% are real. So as you see, we have quite a few false positives. Uh, how, how can it be used? It can be used uh, through a command line uh, and uh, there is an uh, instruction how to download data for it. Uh, it can be used as a REST service, which we don't have official uh, endpoint yet, uh, but locally it can be installed. Uh, and we work on a, a GUI. So uh, this is a, uh, like a quick example. So if somebody clicks on the BHL book, uh, they can see a page, they can see name, and uh, they can say if it's right or if it's wrong. Uh, and if it is about a description, uh, is it really a description of the name uh, or not? Or you can uh, look at the taxonomical data for a name with a different synonymy, uh, synonymy and uh, go through pages fast. Uh, how, can, how we want to use it is uh, through TaxonWorks uh, as a plugin to TaxonWorks, so people who work on a particular plate, they uh, look at the literature, they can uh, uh, find and annotate uh, data from BHL there uh, for catalog of life. Uh, like from this uh, exercise, we can get uh, names that we found. And from BHL, um, we didn't talk about it uh, exactly yet, uh, but I think we can uh, do it similar how BHL uses um, GN Resolver and uh, provide uh, like taxonomic intelligence to users. Uh, thank you. So. Dimitri, thanks. Odima, thanks for this talk. Um, there's a, there are a couple of questions. So is there a progress indicator for articleization, number of pages in serial tabs versus numbers of pages included with articles? Um, uh, 
with, with the pages uh, uh, situation is uh, sometimes it's very well defined, sometimes it's not. Um, so I, I think uh, uh, like something that what Nikki Nicholson suggested uh, just to use uh, images of pages to classify them through AI uh, to distinguish where articles are in the document and uh, just to figure out how we can define globally pages in BHL. Um, another question is, do you need to disambiguate BHL authors too? Uh, to disambiguate authors? Um, yeah. uh, we don't have it yet. Uh, we do plan to have annotation. Uh, I think at the moment it is important because uh, we have approximately 60% of false positives uh, uh, from what we find. Uh, it's mostly uh, it's uh, a lot of fuzziness uh, on top of other fuzziness. However, a lot of that can be uh, eliminated because it does give a, a small score. Um, uh, we definitely want to work on that, uh, but we do not have it yet. So no, no other disambiguations at, at the moment. So Quentin, what do we do? We are six o'clock. And at the end of our meeting, do we continue some questions or do you know? If people are if people are happy to finish up these questions, um, I think that's fine. Uh, we don't have one uh, um, thing directly after this. The next one is up the calendar. Much later, yeah. So I was anticipating to overrun a bit if people don't mind. There's still a few questions left. So Dima, a very basic question in terms of OCR. So how do you deal with that? How do you know that the results you get are meaningful or they're not meaningful because the OCR is very... Uh, OCR can be from amazingly good to amazingly bad. Uh, I've seen pages where only one name was detected. Uh, like if you look at the OCR text, uh, human can uh, distinguish only one name from, from that page, even if it's just... Uh, name of the name of the name. Uh, and sometimes uh, OCR is almost perfect. But so, do you have any measures like statistics on how many names you detect per page, for example? Uh, qualify I, I to qualify say, whether something is okay. OCR is okay or not? Uh, yeah, we, we, can, we can do it. We did not try to do it. Um, uh, like we didn't try to calculate statistics, but it, it's definitely doable because uh, we find uh, names uh, and uh, some of them are fuzzy matched, uh, some of them are not fuzzy matched. Uh, from the uh, number of fuzzy matched names, especially like, for example, we have the same name. Sometimes it's correct, sometimes it's uh, with a mistake. And uh, uh, the worse ICR is, the more we get uh, fuzzy matches. Uh, and um, uh, for, uh, for uh, fuzzy matches, we also have a, a score. So we know that it is correct name uh, from uh, total const context of a particular journal. Like if this name is uh, fuzzy matched uh, and the uh, uh, journal is about mollusks and the name is about mollusks, we can be pretty sure that it is correct. So uh, it is possible to calculate. And one thing we uh, want to do is uh, to calculate uh, uh, OCR quality score and give BHL uh, recommendations uh, which of the pages uh, should uh, get more love in OCR ways. And do you have any idea whether, o o whether OCR quality over the years increases? Uh, it depends a lot on uh, fonts and uh, quality of the paper. Uh, some paper is so low contrast um, or so worn out, uh, it, it creates... Uh, I, would, uh, I saw uh, uh, books from 16th century with, uh, finally, finally enough, uh, perfect OCR names-wise. Um, 
with a completely uh, crazy uh, uh, gothic fonts where scientific name is in a perfectly uh, in a perfect uh, like contemporary font in between all these gothic uh, fonts. No, I, I, so, the question was more OCR uh, engines, they change quite a lot. They become much better now. Oh, so yeah, is there yeah. any difference between first rounds, 10, 10 year old OCR in, in? Oh, definitely, definitely better now. Uh, and uh, hopefully it is geometrical. So uh, like Joel said yesterday that he hopes uh, soon OCR will be perfect. I am a little okay. skeptical, but <laughs> we can hope. <laughs> okay, so for synonyms, is there any current discussion about classifying synonyms? Uh, for now we, uh, so for our situation, we use uh, synonyms from Catalog of Life the local of life doesn't try to have a high resolution for synonyms. synonyms. Um, however, uh, if we, uh, it's easy to use uh, to switch the BHL names to another uh, taxonomical source. So it depends on taxonomical source. I, we don't try to deal with synonymy by ourselves. It is whatever uh, we refer to. Um, another question is, how do you deal with subspecies? Subspecies are same as uh, uh, other species, like uh, as species. We do find them. Uh, we do find them if they have ranks or not. Uh, of course, sometimes you might miss it, but it mostly the same as for species, no difference. Did you compare your algorithms or matching algorithms with other algorithms such as those maps IPNI to DOIs, BHL, JSTOR? Uh, I did not try. I know that, um, uh, for example, for uh, finding names in BHL, uh, IPNI has uh, uh, really, uh, really good results sometimes. Uh, and probably I imagine because compared to what we got from uh, BHL. And I suspect it is because uh, they have uh, better uh, parsed uh, references than what we have, because our references are pretty sketchy. <laughs> so did you, did you uh, compare like your speed name tool as a name finders like uh, with other? Um, I, I did uh, for some amount, uh, but I would not say that last two years I had time to that. Uh, probably when I write a paper about it, I will have to do it. But uh, uh, so uh, like one thing that uh, we did use uh, Taxon Finder, we used uh, 1980 before for BHL. Uh, I definitely paid a lot of attention uh, to remove false positives from uh, those two. Uh, and we definitely succeeded with that. So results now are uh, higher quality than they've been uh, before. And from your algorithm, more general question, do you actually find new combinations that are now nowhere in, in, in IPNI or in, in, in a Catalog of Life? Uh, we, we do find uh, names that have a high score, but uh, are not in any databases. And it's not surprising at all to me. Like for example, uh, when we looked at index animalian and uh, uh, compared it with, uh, uh, com uh, with uh, contemporary databases, uh, 25% of uh, index animalian is completely gone from uh, modern databases. So there, there is a huge amount of uh, gray names in BHL. We probably should call it a day now. We, uh... Obviously, people want to break, and there's another session coming up, and they will still want to start. So, 
Okay. Well, we thank in this case uh, all the speakers and all all the many people who took the time to listen to this symposium. And I thank again to to Quentin and Brenda to keep us all floating, which worked very well. So looking forward to meet you another virtual space in later today. Bye. Okay. Thank you, Donald. Thank you very much. Oh, bye.